Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I think we have some viewers on YouTube. So this is, we're really excited to be doing this pre-conference institute. And this is the uh, pre-conference institute for the International Society on Traumatic Studies. And um, it's a conference that's happening in person. And um, we are doing this pre-conference institute to talk about trauma and virtual worlds and how virtual worlds can be used to uh, provide support for folks who are experiencing trauma. So we're going to hear um, from some psychologists, two of whom are next to me, and we'll do some introductions in a moment uh, about their work. And then we'll hear from community members as well about their experience of virtual worlds and trauma and you know how virtual worlds and being an avatar can potentially help people with their trauma as well as virtual reality exposure therapy so as people have their words if you want to kind of come place them maybe like over here uh where i am uh yeah you can kind of come place them and let's make them all uh small as well like the small text uh if you click on it we can modify them and uh, yeah make them the small font as well Great. And for folks who are on desktop, if other people in VR, you can feel free to grab the props and kind of bring them over for the folks who are in desktop. It's a little harder to move things around. I'm having troubles moving mine around here. That's okay. So I'm going to grab it from uh, and take it as well. And uh, one other thing I want to mention for folks while we're just kind of getting set up here. Thank is you. that um, in your quick menu, when you hit the tab key, if you're on desktop or, you know, the settings wheel on mobile um, or in VR, the quick menu button, when you open that little settings gear icon on the right, if you click on that, um, there's volume slider, music, um, and ambient. So you can turn off the music if, it, if it's helping you. Um, uh, so I just want to mention that in case it's distracting for anybody. Great. So we're just kind of compiling for anyone who's just joining. We're, um, you know, we're going to be talking about trauma today, and so we're just having folks use the text tool in their quick menu to uh, put out, you know, what 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 comes to mind when they think about trauma, like one or two words, or uh, and we're just kind of compiling these over here to kind of get a baseline of what folks um, are thinking about in relation to this community event. Great. Um, did anyone? So I think a good, as you are doing this, a good next thing is for us to introduce ourselves as well. Um, while we're in uh, Skip and Money. So uh, yeah, Steve, do you want to go first and introduce yourself uh, for our folks who are here? Sure. Can you hear me now? Great. Lovely. I'm Steve Holland, a psychologist at Vanderbilt University. And um, I've most Can't of my work- hear. Does that work? Oh, I can hear him. Uh, I, can hear him. I can hear him. I can hear you. I'm going to turn on his global voice real fast. I can hear him. I can hear you. One sec, Steve. I'm just going to adjust a setting real quickly. I can find you in this list. Yep. Here we go. Hold on. Again, can you hear me now? Um. Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah. There's a running joke yes. in there somewhere. Yes. Uh, I'm Steve Holland, psychologist at Vanderbilt University. I work with Noah, got a great uh, uh, appreciation for inner world, although I'm virtually hapless when it comes to navigating within inner world. Uh, most of my work is in the area of depression, and I'm no expert when it comes to trauma, but I do know a bit about the folks that are and some of the things that you can do. And as we'll talk further on, we can talk later on, I presume, but there's some things we think we've learned about trauma. Uh, Kim, your push to talk just came off. Um, so if you open a quick click on the uh, toggle push to talk, uh, there's a little bit of background. Uh, I can I can toggle it for her. Okay, great. Um, and Steve, yeah, I just want to repeat the last thing that you said. Not sure I remember the last thing we said, but basically there are things that we think we know about uh, the treatment of trauma 
and uh, PTSD in particular. Not everybody who has a traumatic experience opens PTSD, but there's some things that seem to work particularly well, even though most clinicians are a little avoidant about uh, uh, working with them. And uh, <clears throat> I'd be quite comfortable uh, seeing somebody treated for depression within uh, kind of self-help communities <laughs> like the world. I don't think we quite know yet how well trauma is going to work, but it's worth considering. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and Kim, uh, you did, if you open your quick menu, Kim, uh, with your left uh, quick menu button. Mm -hmm. icon, yeah, I, I can. Uh, the, second, the second icon next to the um, mute button, the microphone, is a push to talk toggle. And you can click the, yep, there you go. And now you hold down the A button to talk uh, like a walkie talkie, basically. Um, and on the right controller, uh, and we can hear you all holding the button down and when you release it we won't be able to hear you um so if you want to introduce yourself as well kim that would be great sure sorry about that i also put a word up here and and i'm not sure quite how to move it to the the back if somebody can help me that would be great thank you <laughs> thank you um so yeah so i'm uh kimberly hefia i'm a an assistant professor of pediatrics at Yale School of Medicine. Um, and I'm co-director, co-founder of XR Pediatrics, as well as the, we have a new center now, the new Yale Center for Immersive Technologies in Pediatrics. And we focus on the use of, of um, immersive tech, so AR, VR, XR, other types of immersive technologies um, in, in youth. Uh, Mostly what I have done for the last 15 years is make video games uh, for youth around um, a lot of different topics. We have done stuff on um, substance use prevention, risk reduction, general risk reduction. Um, we've done LGBTQ bullying, bystander intervention. Currently, we're working on uh, bringing a, a VR video game into schools that focuses on marijuana and nicotine vaping prevention. And we're looking at middle school students. But a big part of what we're trying to do is focus on uh, some of those emotion regulation and uh, coping skills. Uh, because, you know, recognizing that a lot of kids are actually turning to substance use um, you know, not this idea that everyone's doing it. They think it's cool. It's it's a lot of times it's, it's around mental health and it's it's they're dealing with some really tough stuff and don't know how don't really have the skills to uh, necessarily deal with that. So uh, we're really working hard to build in some mental health um, strategies and skill practice into substance use prevention video games that we bring into schools. Fantastic. Thank you. And um. Thank you for being here as well. We're really grateful, Steve and Kim, to have you here. We have two other speakers who will be joining us shortly, uh, who will be able to introduce themselves. Uh, and I can introduce myself as well. I'm Noah Robinson, founder and CEO of Inworld, and also my PhD in clinical psychology. And Steve is my mentor, my uh, doctoral mentor So at Vanderbilt. So um, it's pretty cool. I think it's unusual to be able to go into the metaverse with your PhD advisor. I don't know how many students to do that so i'm grateful steve for um steve is very open to, to trying new experiences and things that have been coming into inner world you can see for 43 months so it's been great good fun uh although again i don't have know how to answer my own cell phone so this is a real experience for me quick comment on kim kim i don't know if you know emily holmes but she's getting some great data uh using tetris uh in emergency rooms for people coming in for the immediate trauma and uh it sounds like it's kind of the same area that you're kind of plumbing but i think that's absolutely terrific what you're doing thank you and i have heard about that yes fantastic yeah and uh yeah that's really interesting and steve if you just want to touch on maybe for folks here who aren't familiar with that research if you just want to touch on that um because the point of this you know this event is kind of to have their folks in the community and at the institute uh uh, pre institute conference kind of coming away with learnings about how virtual environments and games can be used to help people with trauma. So maybe you could just touch on uh, that Tetris work. I think it's very interesting. Well, yeah, just just a quick comment. I'm not sure I understand it fully, uh, but a lot of what happened, well, not everybody who goes through a traumatic experience gets uh, uh, developed PTSD as a consequence, but a lot of it has to do with fill up in the slots of memory. 
And if you get somebody doing something that's distracting, like playing Tetris shortly after the event, as opposed to uh, uh, processing the emotions of the event, there's some reason, there's some evidence that working too much to process the emotions immediately after event actually is more likely to uh, help uh, lead somebody to develop PTSD. But if you're simply filling the slots of memory during that time, um, it, uh, uh, it seems to reduce the odds that you're going to develop PTSD if you've had the misfortune of being exposed to a traumatic experience. And uh, the data actually, I think, look pretty interesting there. And Kim, I love what you're doing. I, uh, again, I don't understand it fully, but I think it's exactly the right uh, way to go. Fascinating. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Great. Um, and see if you can just maybe use the uh, arrow key to rotate kind of towards the audience as well, if you'd like. Um, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Cool. I think that's uh, that's great. It's a little bit hard to know on, on desktop where you are and facing and stuff. Um, uh, fantastic. Well, I'm kind of curious if anybody here, I just want to mention kind of some of the things that we're seeing for folks in YouTube and things like that who um, aren't necessarily uh, able to read this, but I'm seeing a lot of really interesting themes from the text that people popped up when we asked, you know, words that come to mind when you think about trauma. I'm seeing things like self-esteem issues, distorted thinking, I'm actually seeing distortion as a, as a big common one here. Um, anxiety, unerasable pain, terror, healing, uh, you know, damage, self-loathing, guilt, shame and fear, sadness. Um, so a lot of, you know, intense emotions, intense negative emotions. And I see, you know, distortion, this is often referring to, um, you know, a thought that we have maybe about ourselves that might not be accurate. That's leading us to have a lot of negative emotions. Did anyone want to use the raise hand feature and share about the word that they um, chose and, you know, or the term that they chose and why they chose that? How do you use the raise hand feature? That's a good question. So when you hit the um, tab key on your keyboard or the settings wheel on the iOS, uh, the quick menu, there's a little hand icon at the bottom of the quick menu. Um, and if you click on that, it'll raise your hand. Um, and then we can kind of see who's raised their hand the longest and kind of go in order and call on folks. Fantastic. Um, a sensible muse. Yeah, I used four words. Sorry. Um, but I think the most important one uh, up there, uh, uh, so the four words were surprised, as, um, ashamed, grateful, and struggle. Um, struggle is the hardest one, um, surprise, because I never met someone that treated me that way, and it was slow. Um, uh, uh, ashamed because I'm ashamed that I allowed that to happen uh, and didn't see it coming and then grateful because I have my daughter as a result of it and that's the one I think is most important is being grateful for the positive that came out of it and not focusing on all of the negative aspects of it yeah thank you for sharing that and um, I think that's a really interesting point that you're making that trauma can be really difficult and have, you know, really intense negative consequences. Um, and at the same time, learning from what we've gone through can lead to incredible strength and healing and surviving a negative situation can lead people to become more sensitive to help others to, um, you know, do incredible things in, in the world. And so I think that's a really interesting um, additional element. And also Steve and uh, Kim as well, if you ever want to add anything to anything someone is saying or anything like that or respond or anything like that, also please feel free uh, to do that as well. Um, yeah, uh, great. Uh, calm Lama. Sure, thank you. So uh, I put stuck in the past affects me mentally and physically, limits growth if not processed and anger, why? So I had an awful childhood um, and I knew it was bad when I was little, but I didn't know how bad it was until I became a teacher and a parent myself. Um, and so that's where the why comes from and the anger, because so many people knew, the police knew, social services knew, my school knew, no one did anything about it. And it was only until I started getting things like chronic fatigue, 
Oh, thank you so much. Chronic fatigue, um, amongst other things, and severe health anxiety, depression. It's ramped up. I'm in my 40s now. That a doctor sat me down. I've seen many doctors. And you know your body's keeping the score. And they brought out a wonderful book that I haven't read yet. It's on my, on my, and I'm not quite ready to do it. However, many people here, many of the wonderful guys here have mentioned that book as well. Um, and they're saying it's part of my brain that hasn't processed my trauma. So I know that I cannot move on fully. And that's why I'm in Inner World until I process that trauma. And I'm incredibly thankful. Every time I come here, I'm meeting like-minded people with bucket loads of empathy um and this peer support is helping me tremendously through it so one day i'll pick that book up and i'll be able to work through it and i'm, I'm and in the uk this is really important because we don't have therapists all the time we wait all year for rapid eye movement therapy to move me through this and i i can't get instant help so thank you very much for inner world you, you help me every single day well, thank you, Kam Lama, for sharing. And uh, thank you for sharing that. It's really powerful, really, really powerful. And what you've mentioned about the body, interesting. I'm curious, uh, Steve, if you maybe want to comment on um, some of those neurobiological elements about the body's experience of PTSD and trauma. Um, yeah, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, just a couple. Uh, number one, one of the things we've learned is that the single most useful thing to uh, deal with trauma is to relive the experience with a good uh, therapist or supporting group, et cetera. And uh, most folks avoid it. Most clinicians avoid trauma. But, uh, there are three really useful uh, ways of uh, approaching uh, traumatic experiences. And the fall has a, an approach called prolonged exposure, which is actually a little traumatic in and of itself, but it does work. Uh, Patty Rizek has a thing called cognitive processing therapy, which has people write out the traumatic experience and then read over it and talk with the therapist about that. Uh, if you're in England, uh, I, the person I think is the person I would go to for uh, talk or advice is uh, Anke Ehlers, who's at Oxford, but has uh, research groups down at the Mods and other places, uh, one of the best in the world. And uh, they can, uh, again, they would uh, encourage somebody to relive the experience, but particularly when they relive the experience to take a look at what they think they learned about themselves, which almost always is unfair, self uh, uh, referential and uh, not useful, and uh, they have very good results. Um, it, most clinicians avoid dealing with trauma directly, and that's a mistake. Uh, they, they're as avoidant as their clients often are, and everything we've learned is that uh, is approaching it directly. You still have to deal with the issues that the trauma raises, but most of the PTSD symptoms come from trying not to think about it, and uh, the more you can approach it, it what you want to do is own it, get agency over it, and have become something that uh, uh, would turn yourself into a, a veteran of the trauma, not a victim of it. Oh, no, can nice. I say something back really quickly about that? Sure. Really, really quickly. So Ooh. thank you so much. I'm, I, I, so the rapid eye movement, I've been told it's building up to finding a safe place and processing that. And I'm utterly petrified of reliving that. Um, and I'm so pleased you've told me that that's the, you know, as research suggests, it's the best way of doing it. Do you have any kind of place to tell me or to send me on to read about how I could deal with that? Because there's only, we could only get very limited amount of rapid eye therapy here. So anything would be grateful, even if that's later on. But thank you for that. Yeah, we can share, re we can share resources. Uh, we have a trauma channel in our Discord. So we have a chat feature uh, in our app so we can add, definitely follow up with resources and make a note to do that. Um, that'd be fantastic. Brilliant. And no one can I comment? Uh, rapid eye yeah, movement sure. is uh, actually, it's actually an effective therapy. It's based on a scam. And that's not the first time in psychology that something works on the basis of a really bad theory. Uh, Francine Shapiro was a bit of a con artist and the notion that uh, waving a hand in front of your face or touching the body, et cetera, is gonna any way be, you. Uh, facilitative is uh, not all that useful. However, it gives clinicians something to do with their hands when they're doing the right thing, which is to have somebody relive the experience. And anything that helps you relive the experience is actually a, it's scary as hell, but it's a good thing to do. Uh, 
we did a uh, uh, American Psychological Association did a review of the empirical literature probably about 10 years ago now. And the things that work best are reliving the experience and then working through what it means to the individual, et cetera. And uh, um, our rapid eye movement uh, does work as well as well as any of the others, but because it's based on an inaccurate theory, a lot of people dismiss it. I think anything that gets a clinician to work with you on reliving the experience and then making getting a perspective on what it means, uh, you're not responsible for any mistakes that your parents made, uh, but they, you tend to carry them on, and anything that helps you work through that stuff is going to be incredibly useful for you. Oh, thank you so much. That means a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, Khan. Yeah, hi. Um, I put down like reality distorting um, and life changing. Um, and from my perspective, like working in mental health, I think that one of the biggest things with trauma is that it changes. I mean, we talk about like the body, the physical symptoms of PTSD, but also the mind for one immediately thinks that it's in danger very often. But then also like the schemas and the ways that you perceive the world are fundamentally changed. So you may, you know, believe like the world is fundamentally hostile or, you know, if I do something, I'm going to be in danger. And so like these beliefs and these what become your what to you, your objective reality, because you've experienced it. I think that's one of a really major component of trauma and a way trauma work can work through it is like recognizing what your new reality is, what your new perception is, what your new schemas are um, based on the experience that you went through and how your mind and body and all that experience kind of shifted, shifted reality for you. That's really interesting, uh, Khan. And I'm kind of curious, you know, Kim, I know that you've been doing a lot of research in the idea of that virtual environments can help people shift reality and kind of, you know, change someone's perspective or understanding of a situation. Um, and although it might not seem at the surface immediately related to trauma, like the work that you've done with vaping prevention in youth, I think is in terms of giving someone an entire experience that can shift their perspective. So I'm just kind of curious if you could touch on that as well. Yeah, sure. I, I also want to say I'm, I'm being very quiet, but it's intentional because I'm actually just listening to everybody in this entire process. And I, I'm just, I'm fascinated. Um, I think I have a million thoughts, but I just, um, yeah, I mean, this entire thing here of having a, a group of people just sitting and listening to each other, is just amazing, first of all. And, I, and, I, and in my head, I'm sitting here thinking of like how powerful this could be to kids and how powerful this could be to, um, you know, especially kids in schools don't have access to any support at all um, and are going through rough stuff don't even have words to describe it and I'm I'm looking here and you know you guys can send emojis to each other and you can send kids. and some of these things that they, they they're just powerful and I'm, I'm just thinking about how this could translate to kids so even just this environment here you know, this is not, a, this is a virtual environment, but it is being here and immersed here is very, very powerful. Um, and the power of peers is so powerful. And we just, you know, with kids, honestly, and, and most of, you know, kids, their access to supports, any kind of supports, mental health, anything is coming from their schools. Just, it's just how it is, right? And, and schools don't have enough capability to actually help very few if you know very few kids at all and they're these most of these kids aren't even being recognized so just the power of what you're doing here and sharing among your peers is just amazing um so i think this example right here is very very powerful the small things that you're seeing like i just said with the emojis and and being able to share um and hearing each other and having somebody looking at you and engaging um it it, it that does so much um just with this environment, we don't even need to, to bring in anything else. You know what I mean? Like any sort of a, um, environment that we're trying to mimic something, right? Like this is just in and of itself very powerful. But, um, but yeah, so we, we do, we know with behaviors and, and kids, um, especially, and I'm going to, when I say kids, we generally, you know, work with kids up to, I say kids, but you know, young adults, right? In their twenties. 
um, but pediatrics can expand up to almost 30 now, right? Um, but, you know, the you guys, I'm speaking to the choir here about the power of just being in an immersive environment. You guys can sense it. You sense like people are with you. Um, you can use, you, you're transported. You no longer feel like you're in the room you're in. Um, and for adults, we have a better understanding and we can separate like these worlds much easier than kids. So can you imagine the power that kind of immersive uh, environments like this have for young people? We can really, really take advantage of that, fully immerse them and, um, and, and take, you know, I, I guide them in a lot of ways and really fully interact. Just on the, the physical part alone, oh, thank you. <laughs> The physical act, like the part of just being in a headset, this always amazes me with kids. We only have their attention sometimes about as long as a TikTok. When they're in a space like this, they're not looking on their phone. They're not engaging with the, somebody sitting next to them. They're not on their computers. You have them fully engaged and fully immersed, and they are paying attention to what's there in their environment. And Aww. Oh, I think no. her uh, teammate might have. So she'll be, oh, she'll no. be back. Not moved. I know. I think she'll be back. She'll be back in a sec. We uh, hope so, also, anyway. we just had. So we actually had. Of course, this happens during. Um, you know, technology always fails when you need it the most. But uh, we had a, <laughs> app, a glitch where nobody could actually log into our app. Uh, so that's why Skip here, who just joined us, Skip, you can come down uh, and kind of join us at the bottom uh, here if you want. And uh, yeah, you kind of. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, Skip is, uh, we, we've kind of, yay, Kim's back. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Skip, we've kind of been introduced, we've introduced ourselves and we've uh, shared to, uh, and I think Ioni is here as well. I want to come down. Uh, I saw Ioni log in. I'm not sure she is in the amphitheater yet, but um, Ioni and Skip are our, our other two panelists as well who are here. And we've asked folks to kind of share uh, some words that uh, mean something to them related to trauma. And, and that's sparking a really fascinating discussion where um, the folks on the panel are able to weigh in and kind of share any kind of um, uh, psychological insights of what the research says or you know how it relates to their own work and things like that. So feel free to chime in as we're going through folks, but I'd love for you um, and Ioni, Welcome, Ioni. Uh, sorry about this bug that was stopping you guys from being able to get in. Um, uh, Ioni, you can come down as well. Uh, yeah, into the into this little amphitheater. I can move over here a little bit. Uh, and yeah, maybe one one person can come between me and Steve as well. Uh, maybe yeah, I think that's fantastic. Uh, but yeah, Skip and Ioni, I'd love for you to both introduce yourselves now that you're here. Um, and yeah, so maybe if you want to first, and you have to hold on the space bar uh, to speak, like a walkie-talkie, and then when you release it, uh, people can't hear you. So if you want to tr introduce yourself. Okay, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Skip Rizzo, and I, I'm at the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies, and have been doing work with VR for clinical applications for a few years, and um, I find um, this type of metaverse world to be quite fascinating, even though I, I'm still a little bit of a novice, believe it or not, in navigating around in this stuff. But um, yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. And by a few years, how many years have you been doing research with virtual reality? Well, I, I started the lab at USC in 1995. And back then, it was very, um, the, the technology wasn't that mature. Even though there were these type of metaverse worlds that were quite primitive and they were tech space, um, things like active worlds and black sun and so on. And I played around a little bit with that, but mostly my work is, you know, involved um, developing VR environments that required a head mounted display for treating PTSD with exposure therapy or fostering role play training um with folks on the autism spectrum for functional everyday social skills and uh some cognitive assessment work and a little bit of physical therapy game-based work and so on so uh that's that's what i've been doing over the last few years Skip, you guys are both at usc do you know each other Yes, Ioni, I think Steve was saying, Ioni and Skip are both at uh, University of Southern California as well. So, yeah, um, yeah. USC, the hotbed of VR. Yes, yeah, it's yes. really wonderful. 
Iona, you want to introduce yourself next as well? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. So hi, everyone. My name is Ioni Azawa. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Southern California. Um, so I'm actually housed in the Department of Psychology, but I've been here. This is my second year at this position, but previously working very closely with Noah and uh, Dr. Steve Holland. And we've been doing really um, just really cool work also related to interrel, just really trying to understand kind of the improvements that everyone might be experiencing in terms of clinic like uh, kind of symptoms, any kinds of um, kind of changes in emotions and what might be leading specifically to that, whether it's the skills that um, we're teaching in groups or um, just kind of like the, the social support and the networks that are really developing between members. So really excited to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Ioni. Um, and Ioni has a great, uh, and also has a lot of experience evaluating internet-based uh, interventions for cognitive behavioral uh, therapy and things. So it's really, um, fascinating research background. Um, also, I'm just going to mention uh, one thing to our panelists here. Um, if you open your quick menu using the tap key or the uh, quick menu button for Kim, there's a picture of a megaphone, which is the third icon on the bottom. And if you just click that once, it will uh, turn on what's called global voice so everybody can hear you uh, throughout the entire world. Um, so again, if you hit the tab key on your keyboard, it brings up the quick menu and then you hit that megaphone icon. This, this says toggle global voice. Um, and that will turn on your uh, global no, voice. I'm clicking it, it's not turning on. Oh, interesting. okay. Um, in that case, uh, if you guys just move, let's just move a little bit forward. Um, if you just move a little bit towards the audience uh, so that they can, yes, perfect. that's that's perfect. Um, just so that we can make sure everybody can hear. Um, fantastic. Well, we're just kind of going through and uh, talking, hearing from folks who share uh, a word or two behind us about what trauma means to them. And then uh, folks in, in the panel are able to respond and chime in with uh, a brief that they're aware of or things that are related to what folks are talking about. And also folks on the panel have prepared a little bit of um, uh, you know, a, a, or talk about what their work is and what they're working on. Um, so I, we, we definitely want to get to that. Uh, so maybe I think we'll go through the current hands that are raised uh, all the way to do a unicorn. Um, and then uh, we will, then folks on the panel can share any additional information that they will about their research. And um, yeah, and then we'll look at the time. We'll probably, uh, we have about an hour left or so. So um, yeah. Uh, Thank you everyone for being here. This has been a fantastic discussion so far. So um, right now folks are sharing what they wrote and why, and then we're kind of responding as a panel uh, to each person and, and bringing in any kind of research that we're aware of and things like that. Um, so yeah, uh, Kate and Amy, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so I picked uh, guilt and shame or fear, um, just to be uh, transparent um, in recovery. And um, there's a lot of, there's a stigma to it and um inner world has been life-changing for me because um my parent i come from a, a very wealthy family and i decided to call in prescriptions to be really short i went to prison and uh, my past follows me wherever i go and I, it's like i felt i couldn't be me i couldn't um be oh she got disconnected oh, oh, oh no. man. that's her heart I've I think she'll be back in a second. Um, yeah. And, wow, it was really powerful what she was saying. And, uh, you know, we're really grateful for so many folks in the community sharing, you know, uh, these incredible stories, uh, you know, of their lives. And um, yeah, so we'll we'll give it a sec for her to come back in. Um, and Rudster, if you want to go next and we can come back to Kate and Amy, uh, hopefully she's able to get back in. Sure, absolutely. Um, you can call me Rudy. My name is Rudy. Um, I don't mind sharing that. Um, I picked uh, fear and anxiety um, basically for two reasons. Um, uh, the first one was um, everything was fine in my childhood until I hit nine and my mother passed away from cancer. And right away that was um, a very dark spot in my life. And I think I blocked a lot of that out. And um, so that led to a to a lot of anxiety in my younger years which of course led me to alcohol which was my best friend for 35 years or so and currently i'm in recovery um i just celebrated six years um kate just came back um do you want me to hold or keep going 
Yeah, yeah, you can keep going, and then once Kate gets back to the um, amphitheater, we can uh, have or continue okay. uh, sharing. Yeah, so please feel free to continue. Um, first of all, also thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it. This is fantastic. Um, and um, yeah, the other one was um, I just celebrated six years of sobriety, and um, when I think of fear and anxiety, you know, I'm still full of fear because um, I basically don't know who I even am, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I've been using drugs and alcohol basically, you know, since I was 13, 14 years old. So now being at the age of 59, I'm trying to, you know, um, basically control my character defects and things like that. And, um, it's been scary and it's been very enlightening and, and beautiful and wonderful, you know, it, it was the hardest thing I ever did hands down on it, but it was also the most beautiful thing I've ever done, you know, and as hard as it was, it was so worth it. And, and I'm so glad to be where I'm at. And um, so I won't take up too much more time and thank you everyone that shared before me. I appreciate that. And, um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for sharing uh, Rudy. And, you know, we're really grateful to have you here. And I think, and anxiety are really important, um, you know, are things that can really impact uh, someone's recovery from trauma. I don't know if anyone wants to uh, kind of respond or comment uh, to Rudy, and then we can also come back to Kate and me. I know that you got disconnected during uh, your incredible share that you were doing, so we'll come back to you next. Um, but yeah, anyone on the panel want to respond to what Rudy is uh, sharing? Nope, nobody? Okay. No, well, no, no, I will I'll, say. I'll, I'll just okay. kidding. Let's do. Uh, no. Yeah, let's do Kim and then skip. Sure. Yeah, no, no. I would. What I was saying when when I was hearing you talk about this, you know, dealing this with since you were nine and just the importance of how we can reach kids early, and a lot of that's through identification of trying to find kids that need that support, but then also helping kids just get some of those basic skills that you know you didn't have around, you know, dealing with all of this. And I, I just thank you for sharing that. It, it really does, you know, and I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, d I'm sorry that, that you had to go through this. But it, to me, it, it just, it is a reminder of how important it is to try to get to, to youth as early as we can. Yeah, it's so strange. Like back, back in those days, like everything was so secretive and like swept under the carpet, you know, and I remember like, even going to school and like kids whispering about, and you know, I knew what they were talking about, but it was, you know, and I should have been in therapy right from day one, you know, and, um, but you know, I've, I've managed to survive and thank God, you know, I'm not my, you know, where I am and they, you know, pretty much now I basically help other people and that helps me, you know, so in order to keep this, I have to give it away, you know, and, um, red eyed is, is a real good friend of mine. She's, you know, we talk about it all the time. I'm, I go to AA meetings a lot also, you know, on top of Interworld. And, um, you know, I've met some of the most sincere people in my life and um, they've got me through some hard, you know, parts of my life. And, you know, Interworld is just fantastic. I love this so much. And, you know, the people in here are also some of the most sincere people I've ever met in my life, you know? And um, I think, you know, the, this, this is just amazing, you know, and when I can't make it to an actual meeting, the first thing I do is put on my headset and come in here and, you know, and, and see some of my friends here that are in here. And it's just fantastic. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. It's really, I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing and being horrible. Uh, and sharing your story and history and what came that is really powerful that um, if we can have interventions, uh, you know, to that, that can reach children who are going through trauma. We can help folks um, avoid, you. Uh, you know, the consequences. Maybe become more resilient um, as well, and, and and kind of learn the tools earlier. Um, and Skip, were you gonna add something as well? Uh, yeah, sure, um, Rudy. I was I was um, interested in in your impression about the difference between interacting in a space like this versus like an in-person AA meeting. Uh, can, can you weigh in a little bit on that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you know, absolutely. Like, you know, when I, 
when I drive to an AA meeting, you know, um, you know, it's, it depends on the meeting, but I, I've never been to a bad meeting in my life. You know, um, my, my fellowship is, um, you know, I've been doing it for five years now, five and a half years, and I've met some really amazing people. And uh, so a lot of times I look forward to it and then it's where I don't feel like going. And there are the times that I really think I need to push myself. And that's when I do go, <laughs> you know, that I, I know I need it because, you know, I can get a little squirrely real fast, you know, if I, if I stay in my head too long, which also makes inner world great. You know, like I could pick up my headset if there is, you know, something that were re a reason that I can't go, something pressing that, you know, that I can't go to an actual AA meeting. I can actually come to, you know, inner world. But, um, yeah, um, what I, I, I don't know what you meant, like, the, the, what else, like, I don't know what else I could add to that. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I was just wondering about, um, you know, do you feel in this kind of a space that it's easier to talk sometimes? Um, you know, we've oh, done gotcha. research. We, yeah, we've been doing research looking at how people interact with virtual humans, with AI type characters. And, you know, we often find people are oftentimes more willing to self-disclose personal information uh, when they're yes that's... absolutely um i i feel a lot freer on here because basically you're kind of behind you know you're kind of hidden behind an avatar and that gives you know you could you can kind of sit in the corner and hide somewhere or you can come out in front and and share what you want to share you know which may which has a lot of power to it you know it's like you know people that are kind of like sneaking around meetings and just listening to them you know, that's amazing because eventually they're going to want to chime in, you know, um, whereas, you know, an actual meeting, you're kind of there and you're not forced to put your hand up. But, I, I, you know, some meetings you you are, you know, they want you to share. Um, I can't really say that. That's not really true. I mean, um, I, I guess it depends where you are, you know, but I mean, I definitely feel more comfortable in the inner world, you know, because I'm in my living room for one thing, you know, I have... My cat's right there, and the refrigerator's over there. <laughs> you know, so I got it made as far as that goes. But um, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's just fantastic, you know. And uh, Noah, thank you for coming up with you know this whole idea. Is it's it's just amazing, man. You know, you guys are fantastic. It's a wonderful well, thanks. idea. Thanks, Rudy. And um, I'm actually curious. Skip's question here. Um, you can hit the tab. You can open your quick menu and use the emojis at the top. You can do thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, how many people here feel more comfortable uh, closing vulnerable things in a virtual environment than they do in the real world? I'm just kind of curious. Seeing a lot of thumbs up. Uh, yeah, interesting. I think it's a kind of, it seems like a property of the virtual environment and the avatar, like Skip's done a lot of research on this and Kim as well, that uh, that's, a, that's a unique thing about virtual reality is that it has a sense of presence where you feel like you're with other people and it's anonymous at the same time. Um, exactly. And it's really the only technology that can do that, I think, um, where you really have that sense of interpersonal connection. Um, and we know that thing, actually, maybe Ione, you could just mention nonspecific effects and what we know about and how that relates to this uh, connection before we move to um, uh, Kate and Amy. Oh. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, a lot of work with just kind of like face-to-face -face therapy and in, in the real world and uh, like outside of the inner world and it's been one of these kinds of factors where we see like in therapy just having that connection with the therapist or with other group members can be really effective in helping someone feel better or kind of overcome you know if they're feeling depressed or anxious um, but in here we're seeing that it's even just more than that it's the a lot of like the community that sense of like social support and building that kind of network that really seems to go above and beyond just yeah the relationship with let's say a therapist so um, we've done a little bit of work on that and so it's really great to even hear everyone's individual experiences that are really hinting at this thank you thank you thank you, thank you. yeah steve were you gonna answer that say, uh I'm a big fan of professional therapists. I think they have a real role to play, but about two thirds of the effects comes from the non-specifics, And those are the kind of things you get with just people helping people. And uh, uh, the uh, the uh, substance use groups, the inner world, these kind of things, uh, what you guys are doing with one another 
is about two thirds of the effects of what we get from a uh, trained therapist. So full power to it. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So Steve's saying that two thirds of the effects of therapy when, when someone's seeing a therapist and experiencing, you know, improvements in their symptoms is due to that relationship that you're building with the therapist. It's not necessarily due to who the therapist is or what type of therapy you're receiving. It's just having that interpersonal connection and human relationship. And so that's what in a virtual environment, um, especially if someone's, you know, talking about trauma and trying to have that support and connection uh, and validation from other people having that um, can be a really powerful intervention, even when a therapist is not present, uh, since in the new world, we don't have uh, therapy right now. Um, and all of our meetings are led by non-therapists who we train. Um, so thank you. Thank you all. Uh, yeah, Kate and Amy, I know that you got to... Oh, yeah. Not only the two-thirds of the overall effects uh, are done by people helping people, but uh, you really have to get up the severity, chronicity, comorbid comorbidity continuums before having a trained therapist begins to make a difference or having an active medication begins to make a difference. It's not just that two thirds of the effect comes from uh, uh, people helping people. It's that for most folks, that's going to be more than sufficient. Mm, that's very interesting. Yeah, I think. I, I want to also yeah. add too. we, we see this with kids too, which is fascinating, right? That peer to peer support groups with kids is actually one of the most effective interventions that you can have, um, which is surprising, right? Like you would think that we need adults, but um, actually young people, supporting young people is is really powerful. Mm. Very That's amazing. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that, Kim. I think that's really powerful. Uh, Lee, you can, um, did you have a question real fast? And then we can go to Katie. Great. Okay, uh, Kate Mimi. Um, sorry, I don't know what happened. Um, anyway, I um, so there was always a stigma uh, for me, like uh, I couldn't, you know, go to a country club or anywhere where I was network around my family or friends um, without being judged um, because of my past. Um, and I realized, like, uh, interroll ha has been life changing. I got certified as a peer recovery coach, and I found that even in when I was in prison, I wish this could be like with because there's rehabilitation with people believe and believe in people and don't judge. There is rehabilitation, and I'm living proof of that. I even had my son in prison and spoke, uh, shared my story through the addiction series. So I'm not bragging; I'm just saying, interroll is life changing because I don't have to have fear. People can come and they can be who they are and who they want to be without fearing that look or seeing that look or that judgment. And um, I can't, I, it's very, it's very, um, it's, hard, it's very emotional for me because of how big of an impact inner world has become. Um, when you're in prison, you get out, you're, you, you, you go to me, I've been to meetings, all, all those things, but it's that in the therapy. I want to say this really quickly. I'm squirreling. Sorry. If I, I'm talking to a therapist and therapists are great, but sometimes if they haven't been in recovery or they don't have that mental health, but if a peer does and they have been there, like a guide, something, we can relate to something that someone has said or shared and that has become life changing for me and that's why when got certified you can actually get certified for free and to me that's helped me more than anything has um and like i said i wish you could get inner world into all the like prisons and uh because they do have certain things because there is hope and i think that even for kids like i said I went to prison and I got a ticket for destru destruction of state property because I played volleyball and got sunburnt. I was property, you know, and, and uh, went through a lot of trauma. Here, I can be whoever I want to be and I don't have to have fear of it and, and fear of judgment. Um, and so when I could go on and on and, and, and Noah, thank you for developing this. Um, it's just been life changing and um, I appreciate you and everybody. That's all. I'm sorry. I won't take any more time. Thank you. You are loved. Yes. yes. Please go ahead, Skip. Nemi, uh, Kate Nemi, uh, I, I think you bring up a really good point on the prison element because I've always felt that 
you know, if you want to foster rehabilitation in a prison system, you've got to help people to learn to have relationships, not just with fellow prisoners, but, you know, to, to develop relationships with, you know, non-prisoner folks. I don't want to, I don't, I'm having a hard time going up with the right word here to be politically correct, but if, you know, this was an option where people could interact with people outside of prison and develop relationships, learn to have relationships, talk to people that weren't in jail, um, maybe that would prepare them a little better for when they get released, you know, so that their only relationships aren't just with people in prison. The relationships would evolve outside uh, to some degree. Uh, I think there's a real positive learning experience there that can be done uh, not just with, you know, social skill, but the emotional element of connection that I think is really important. Yes. Thank you for sharing that, Skip. I think that's a really good point. And um, <clears throat> I also, you know, Kate and Amy, what you've said is really powerful. Um, and, you know, I think that I, I, I worked in prisons and forensic hospitals uh, when I was in college and trying to eliminate the use of seclusion and restraint and implement trauma-informed care. Um, and, you know, trauma-informed care means that behaviors, the ways of the ways that the system is structured, the ways that, you know, being able to shower with a shower curtain, actually, you know, having some privacy, having some ways that people aren't getting triggered, you know, repeatedly can lead to a decrease, a, a significant decrease, not only, I mean, not only helping with rehabilitation, but also decreasing violence and other kinds of things happening in the prison. And so a lot of the systems um, of trauma-informed care can be really powerful. And I agree that, that the uh, peer-based intervention and accessing you know, a peer support network from that, uh, you know, from prison could be a, an incredibly powerful thing. So um, I really appreciate your- can, uh, I, can I say something real quick? You, you said something about the, yeah, like sure. the shower. So like, um, and that's so true. However, in prison, I'm just gonna speak freely about this because I actually started the first newspaper, women's newspaper, mentor group. They put in clear shower curtains. In women prisons, there's more men working than women. So yeah. when you take a shower, you, you know, you know, I'm not going to go into it and uh, many things happen. I'm not going to go into that either. Um, there just needs to be change. I know they started yeah. the Priya uh, Prison uh, Rape Elimination Act, but that's not enough. They, there's too much, too many, there's too many men working. There's too many things that just go unheard and unsaid. And I, if you've worked in there, then you know, um, but there is hope. And I think that stigma of, of, um, that inmate number, uh, it, it sits with you for the rest of your life, just like in being an addict does. Does and I've been sober since uh, November twenty fourth of twenty eighteen, and still, you know, uh, I, I'm called a dummy or uh, names. My past follows me, and the change has to. It, it, I don't know. I'm very passionate also with CBT and logotherapy, which I don't know if you're. If you know about that, but it's finding purpose and unavoidable suffering. And I'm not saying that people uh, shouldn't be in prison for their actions. However, I started a group and there was girls in there that committed crimes, but yet their parents pimped them out at the age of six or things like that. So this inner world is something that could be life changing. And I know there's wardens that would be open to it and other, even in rehabilitations, I, I worked in a in rehabil uh, a rehab, and this would be, oh my gosh, it's giving me chills. How much it's helped, it really has. That's all. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, you for sharing. Amy. Um, yeah, yeah, we're really thank grateful you, to have you here and have, have you. your perspective. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so we have uh, Spartan Zen, and I know uh, Do a Unicorn. I think you got disconnected, but you've had your hand up as well for uh, a very long time. So, uh, and then I think we had until uh, so we have four more folks, uh, and these are. By the way, this is all really incredible. Everything everyone is sharing. Um, you know, part of I just want to make one last comment before we go to the next person. That part of the idea of trauma informed care and interventions for trauma is that 
instead of it being a top-down approach of developing interventions, um, it you know including people with lived experience in the process of figuring out what works best for whom is a really important part of being trauma-informed and developing interventions. And so I think it's really a special thing that we're able to have you know clinical a group of clinical psychologists here uh, and psychologists, and then you know folks with lived experience who are sharing. And and we you know we all know that this is not a therapy session. It's not therapy. It's a professional uh, science communication event. Uh, and yet hearing the experiences of folks, I think, is really informative for uh, being about prevention development. So thank you all so much for being so vulnerable and sharing um, these incredibly uh, profound experiences that you've had. Uh, so with that, I will go to Spartan. Uh, I just want to first um, in the inner world and thank you for the people on the panel today for being here. Um, and taking your time out of your day to be here with us. And um, I put on the wall a uh, survivor. Um, my daughter was tragically killed and um, I was diagnosed with um, PTSD from that. Um, and uh, before I got here, there was no uh, group settings at all um, for uh, grief. I didn't know what grief was and I had a very demanding job, which um, wasn't I wasn't able to uh, reach out and um, be able to um, show much emotion uh, with the job that I had. So um, I ran in the world and when I um, I was able to feel and I was able to show emotion and and it was okay to do that. And um, the thing that I like most about this world is the guides, um, they feel and they have emotion and they have been there with us and they walk with us um, through every bit of the way, um, you know, and they're open for talk if you need them, um, you know. And so um, I was um, a day away from suicide. <laughs> And uh, if you look above our heads, this is how many months we are. And I have five months of life, and that's the way I look at it. And I will continue on working on myself and knowing that now that that wasn't an option for me, that there is life. And um, I just want to tell you guys how grateful I am for Noah and this world and the people in it. Um, you know, they're very close to my heart and uh, it saved my life. So with that, thank you for letting me share and I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, wow, Thanks, Spartan, Spartan, you know. We love you. Yeah. You love know, you, Spartan. Yeah. And you know, I wanna say that uh, the thing that saved, you know, it's so incredible to hear that it saved your life. And, you know, I know people are thanking me and things like that, which I, for but really the people who are saving lives are all of you you are saving each other you are helping each other and that is the whole theme of this i think and especially with trauma hearing the power of this peer support that by coming together as a community and having these non-judgmental interactions where that's safe you know with the, the strict community guidelines the kind of guardrails on the interactions, the healing that can happen is just so profound and powerful um, and when we're 5 million therapists for the United States alone, I think that we have to look to these kinds of solutions. Um, so it's really everyone in the audience who uh, is helping to create these profound effects. So thank you, Spartan, so much for sharing about that. Um, I don't know if anyone on the panel wanted to add anything as well uh, before we go to the next uh, speaker as well. Um, I would. Um, you know, we're actually, I'm working on a an intervention right now. It's not an intervention, maybe it's something more personal, but I also lost my son when he was six and it was, I don't even, I don't think I knew what PTSD was, nor did I really quite, quite understand it until maybe 10 years later that that's what I was actually going through. But one of the, the goals that I, you know, kind of a project that I've been working on, it's funded and it's through Yale and it, and it has a purpose, but it's, it's really to try to help those that are caring or working with parents that have lost a child to better understand how it is a, a lifelong process. It is something that you have 
it is something you will have and 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 you know kind of i don't want to say cope or deal with it's just but it is who you are now for the rest of your life but trying to help others try to understand that and use oh no oh, oh, oh bummer i hope she's okay <laughs> yes i think yeah. there's a she did internet, move. Uh, yes yeah, yes sure i think she'll be right back um oh that's what the issue is yeah you uh, gotta move uh, uh, is she teleport yeah, mode? So she's I'm... not teleporting. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. And we will fix that. Sorry, everyone. I'm sorry that that code issue is leaving that. Does anyone else on the panel want to add anything? I just want to keep us on this thread until uh, Kim gets back. So does anyone on the panel also want to add anything? Uh, yeah. yeah. I can add something really fast. Um... So yeah, I, I really appreciate just hearing all these stories and it's, it is really just wonderful to just uh, to kind of bear witness to everyone's experiences and um, thank you so much for, for sharing. And this idea of like these um, guides, like they are playing such a huge role and um, some of my prior work is kind of looking at these digital treatments where it's um, more self-guided, like an application on your cell phone or kind of joining like an online program where you're doing it by yourself. but we really see that these digital interventions can be more effective when there is some kind of support along the way. And so really having this opportunity to have this world where there are people in it together um, really can make a huge difference. And so um, again, yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, I mean, thank you, Ioni. Uh, Steve, are you going to add something? Well, and I think Kim just came back in uh, as well. So she'll be here in a sec. Let me let Kim go first. I think she's still making her way Unless just, uh, just here from an evolutionary perspective, we are wired up to be particularly sensitive to the loss of a child, a variety of other things, and that's good as far as it goes that helps uh, keep our infants alive. On the other hand, when we get stuck, is when we start blaming ourselves for things that may not have been may have been outside of our control. And getting on top of that is an incredibly useful process, and support groups really help doing that. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Steve. And I see, yes, uh, and I see Kim. You are back. Uh, one thing we learned is that you have to if, every few minutes or like every five minutes, if you teleport, right? If you point your hand at the ground and just teleport just once, uh, I think it's timing you out is the issue. Uh, you have to uh, just move around. Just, okay. Yeah, we just so sorry about that. That's a glitch we will fix. But uh, if you want to continue, um, I think you were just <laughs> starting to share about the program. Yeah, no, I can, I can, I was just going to say, I think one of the, you know, the, one of the big processes of doing this was I interviewed, I mean, my son died 19 years ago, so it's been, it's been a while, but I've been going to interviewing my family and my friends, um, his school teachers, uh, people in the community. I just wanted to, to create this story, and I thought it was my story about the loss of my child, but it, it turned out to be a greater community story. Um, and and I, I, I didn't know so much of the story. I didn't know how, how much his tiny little life impacted an entire community. So I, I don't know, again, that power of, of connection to people, like you were saying, Noah, talking about that and just, uh, I don't know, it, it's been really powerful. So this thing that I, I'm working on, this VR experience around the, the, my experience as a parent, the loss of a child has turned into this story around more of, a, of a, a our narrative community's narrative um, and how that's when you try to put all of that together. But the goal of that is just to try to show, how, you know, grief and loss of the child is, is, is very different in terms of an expected kind of when we expect our parents to die before us, our grandparents, right, our elderly neighbors, but not children. So it, it is very, very difficult to kind of wrap your head around for your entire life. Um, so yeah, so just trying to even use this kind of technology to create social story, like social story and narratives together and finding meaning, meaning making. Um, I think we can do that in really powerful ways through community and, and connection to people. Even for a story that we thought was our own, it really helps to share it and, and create a bigger story, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's really powerful. I and mean, thank you, Kim, as well, for sharing uh, about your own experience. And I think it's incredible how you're using qualitative research as well. Where, you know, we talked about um, 
I think folks will share a little bit more about their research uh, in as the next book share. But uh, you know, qualitative research being a very powerful way. Uh, you know, we use numbers to track changes in in symptoms and other kinds of things like that. But really, qualitative research where you're asking people questions and trying to understand themes and connections that can lead to really new interventions to be developed, new ways of um, you know uh, creating interventions. So uh, yeah, thank you for sharing. About that project well, I, very exciting. my uh, my dissertation chair told me once we live in stories not statistics and that has stuck with mm. me forever and so I, I think i'm a true qualitative researcher because of that because it's true the numbers say a lot but it's, it's where the stories are where we find find the meaning very wise Love advice that. there's a context of discovery and that almost always comes from stories personal experience then there's a context of just of uh confirmation which is where you test things out but you got to start with an anecdote. Got to start with a personal experience. And every new therapy that's ever been developed that's worked has started that way. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Art Nut, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, there's just one thing that I want to, uh, one point I want to raise, which hasn't um, been mentioned yet, and that is how uh, instant this is in the sense that. Um, um, Arna, you're a little bit maybe far from your microphone. If you could get a little bit closer. Is that there? Yeah, I think that's a little bit there. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say that um, how how instant um, this is in the sense that like I could be I, I could wake up at two o'clock in the morning um, feeling really down and um, and have someone to come and talk to. Um, and you know that that is really really powerful compared to trying to sort of like organize um, something in the real world. Um, and you know, and I've noticed that even with you know when it, when others come in and and there's just something that's uh, happened or and they and they'll go to the guide straight away and and have like a private um, conversation. The, the, this is really really powerful. It's 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 just. It's so good to be able to sort of have this as a um, as an instant way to to work through your problems. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Yeah, I think the accessibility is important, and um, I think it's you know there's a lot of research questions as well. Uh, if someone's uh, has a history of trauma, for example, is uh, experiencing a trigger or a flashback and things like that. Just the knowledge that they can come in and talk to someone immediately about it and feel comfortable opening up. How, how does that impact, you know, someone's sense of psychological safety even? Like, you know, does that help? So there's one thing about PTSD is that it's, uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy almost because you become uh, trying to avoid thinking about the trigger leads to the maintenance of those symptoms. And that's why I was therapy is very powerful is that you you have someone lean into uh you know re-experiencing what they've been trying to avoid but it's interesting to think about the increased sense of safety that community can provide for someone um and how that might impact that instant access to a safe non-judgmental community those non-specific effects and how that could affect uh you know the trajectory of ptsd i think that's a open kind of research question as well i don't know uh, research question but we know a few things is that most trained professional clinicians are more avoidant of dealing with the trauma than their clients are. Clients tend to avoid, and their therapists especially tend to avoid, when the American Psychological Association did a uh, review of the empirical data on treatment of PTSD, the three things they recommended were exposure, exposure, and exposure. And uh, they published that in 40,000 uh, members of the American Psychological Association <laughs> because they didn't do that. That's uh, over two thirds of the members. And it's just striking how uh, most professional therapists are more uh, resistant to dealing with that with their clients than uh, clients are these kind of self-help groups are. Fair you know, I'd like to weigh in on that as well. Um, I, I think you bring up a really good point. Um, you know, I always uh, say, you know, certainly what we're doing is hard medicine for a hard problem, but it's what the science shows works, you know, confronting and reprocessing difficult emotional memories, but with social support or with the support of a therapist, that's, you know, that's really the, the path that all the science points us towards. And there's so many different variants of 
ways that exposure can be done. I mean, the, the you know, the Edna Foa approach to prolonged exposure is just one of them. Uh, you know, I would say that, you know, as many have, uh, EMDR has an exposure element. We're not sure, you know, how much that contributes to the, the value of it, but, uh, and cognitive processing therapy. I mean, you know, writing a narrative about your experience is a form of exposure. So, you know, I think uh, this is where some of the value of technology comes in. Um, certainly, we've seen it in our work with VR exposure therapy, where you can put a veteran in a combat environment, but with everything calm, um, sitting out in a Humvee in the desert, and kind of, you know, get them talking about their experience in a way that isn't so confrontive, but eventually be able to systematically control the stimuli and ramp it up so that the person can at a pace they can handle, start to, you know, dig into that trauma narrative in an emotional way. And I think that's really the power of these sorts of simulated environments. And certainly, you know, when we first got started and when Barbara Rothbaum got started, got in 1998 with virtual Vietnam, there was a lot of criticism by traditional exposure therapists even, and forget about them, the people that didn't use exposure, didn't believe in it. They were highly critical. They were saying, oh, you're going to re-traumatize people. You're going to, you know, have all these ill effects. And I'm happy to say that people that have done deterioration analyses and have looked at uh, VR exposure compared to other active treatments, you don't see any increment in that those kinds of negative effects. Um, and in fact, you, you know, you see, you see a lot of positive. So, um, you know, sometimes... Uh, you know, the, the people that are that are psychologists that maybe were trained many years ago, they're still using uh, the science and the application that they learned in graduate school and haven't kept up to date. They're not a total criticism of everybody in psychology, because certainly uh, people in uh, the last 30, 40 years, you know, been brought up in an empirical clinician model. And I think that's, that's important. You've got to, you've got to look at the science and what drives all this. You know. Anyway, I'll shut up now. Uh, no, no. Skip I'll be, be correct. And I got to say, it was my own graduate students who were work, uh, getting experiences away from our training program with the Sexual Assault Research Center that shamed me into doing it with a couple of my clients. And when I started doing it, it, it just worked better. Uh, and again, ther experienced therapists are often overly uh, avoidant to doing these kind of things, but some kind of exposure and then dealing with what you think it means about you, which almost never does, is the single most effective thing we have. Very interesting. Yeah. And and I think, Skip, what you've also mentioned and something Steve has mentioned, which is that training of therapists, like to change the way a therapist does something is generational. It's not, you know, it's hard to have a therapist who's been working for 20 years doing things one way and, and then evidence shows that doing something a different way is better or it could be more effective. Um, it's hard to change the, the way that a therapist is uh, doing something versus uh, trainees, you know, who are learning, oh, this is the best evidence way, evidence based way to do it. This is how you approach, you know, treating uh, trauma or something, you know, treating a specific type of disorder. So um, that's one unique advantage, I think, of inner world, although therapy, uh, we're training guides every month, you know, um, and so you can update the training much faster because it doesn't take seven years of graduate school um, to get to the point of delivering an evidence-based tool or teaching an evidence-based tool. So um, updating training methods, I think, is a really interesting uh, theme kind of that's coming out of this as well in terms of making sure it's evidence-based and um, that we're, you know, in a helping folks with trauma uh, get the best interventions that they can. Um, so I want to go to Calm Lama. Yeah, mine was really quick because I've obviously shared before, but I want to know where I could find more information, uh, especially Kim. I'm a special educational needs and trauma behavior teacher specialist in the UK. Um, and I'm incredibly interested about your research because I deal with the students that have been suspended or completely thrown out of education or they're moving because they're in the, the care system. So that's my daily job and, and, and I'd love to know about 
and what Steve, was it Steve, is it Holland, was saying early about Tetris and trauma because that's exactly what I did as a child when I was going through my trauma, which is why I never understood why it was hitting me in my 20s and 30s. So I'm really interested to know where I could find out more about your research, basically. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, the work I, we do is not trauma specific. It's more, it's more prevention. We're looking at a lot of uh, skill, skill building around, you know, a lot of DBTA, you know, in schools, which, you know, DBT that's been, you know, translated for schools and, and younger populations, adolescents, especially um, emotion regulation, like I talked about coping skills, a lot of that early stuff that we can put into prevention. Um, but I'm happy if uh, to to kind of share, you know, the stuff we're working on and some of the great researchers at Yale that I get to work on that this is like their, their main every day to day focus. So um, I, if I, I can, I don't know how to get that information to you, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to connect you. Um, um, Noah, what do you suggest? Yeah, we can definitely do a follow uh, information. Uh, I think we can probably send an email out to folks. And uh, if you haven't heard, just message me on Discord and I'll uh, be a prompt to do it. But yeah, we, we can send some follow, -up, follow up information as well of what was discussed. I think it's a great idea. Um, yeah, Steve, yeah, I'd be happy to share um, some papers and um, and so on uh, that pass over to you if I pass them to Miller or something. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. And this is Steve, uh, the two things to, to focus on uh, for more, con well, say conventional, it's cutting edge, uh, probably the, as good as anything else in the field. Uh, the cognitive therapy uh, person at Oxford is Anka Ehlers, E-H-L-E-R-S. I think she also has a research pro going on at the Maudsley down in London, but she's absolutely top of the field. And then the person with the Tetris is Emily Holmes, who used to be at Oxford, actually had Anka's office when Oxford was down at the Maudsley, and now Anka's moved back, so she's uh, uh, Emily is off at the Karolinska, but she's the person that cognitive psychologist who's doing the work with uh, Tetris and other video games to cut right into the midst of the trauma. And we're, we're just light years ahead of what we used to be able to do uh, two, three decades ago. Wonderful. Incredible. Thank you, you know, so much. Can I, can I throw in a, a quick pitch as well? Um, yeah. Uh, on Saturday at ISTSS at 9.30, we have a, a session on using VR and associated technologies with uh, oh oh I'm sorry one of the speakers um, uh, Jessica Stone will be presenting on her virtual sand tray application for children and this is a way for children to represent their trauma in a in, in a fashion that isn't as confrontive that they can build worlds with archetypic objects like in, in traditional play therapy i'm not sure if you're familiar with that where you have physical objects and everything well you've got a virtual version now with over six thousand pieces of content that a child can use to represent their world their feeling state and so on and so she'll be presenting as part of that and also one other thing um, we're doing something similar to inner world but in romania with spherical with the spherical image based virtual metaverse world where we've taken spherical images of common places in ukraine and we have software that allows similar to this for people ukrainian refugees uh, to gather and to be able to talk about their experiences and you talk about their grief loss and their hopes um, yeah, because we really strongly feel social support and being able to tell your story is important. And this is one of the problems. Where you're available on multiple platforms so for seniors who might ne not necessarily be open to the concept of uh, VR, they certainly have uh, an iPhone uh, or, or, a, or any, any smartphone. I know you're only available on uh, iOS, uh, but with a computer, 
um, it would be wonderful. Yes, thank you. Uh, I heard Skip and Steve. Uh, uh, Skip, go ahead. Uh, okay, I was, I was just going to say, you know, um, I, I think you bring up a really important point that this is not just for 20 somethings. Um, you know, certainly, um, you know, as you, I, I know from experience, becoming slowly into the older adult cohort, that problems in living do not just go away. Maybe we, we can deal with some of them better, but as you get older, there are different challenges that you face and having a group you can talk to and not only talk about the, the, the challenges you're facing, but have a shared experience based on a generational familiarity where you can talk about the good things. And so, I mean, I find myself talking about 70s music, you know, on, on places like this, you know, that maybe I wouldn't be able to find somebody uh, that I could talk to about that. But I mean, the, the good and the bad, uh, I think it's a, a great opportunity. And, and it, this shouldn't be viewed as technology only for the young. This is tr a transformational intergenerational uh, approach here. And it has, I think it has a lot of value across the full age span. And Charlie, this is Steve. I have to ask, you're 73, I'm 74. What become seniors? <laughs> good, good question. Age is just the number. And as they say, and is unlisted. There you go. <laughs> all my brothers yes. band all the way. <laughs> right, yeah. Skip? Whipping bows. There I mean, you go. <laughs> it's also it's also interesting because if you look around the room, you can't really tell, you can't tell what age everybody here is. And think about how different it would feel. If, I mean, it's very unique to have social groups like this with such a diverse age range. You know, that doesn't really happen in the real world that much. Um, and if it does, people, especially younger people, you know, might feel anxious or, you know, things like that. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's very interesting that, you know, we have this diverse age group here in front of us and um, there's no, you know, you know, it's just kind of an equal playing field for everybody. Um, and it also allows, I think, the wisdom of folks who are older to make a bigger impact on folks who might be younger because there aren't those kind of, uh, you know, necessarily kind of discomforts or kind of, you know, maybe some people, some people get anxious because, you know, there's folks who are their parents' age or things like that. So it really just allows, I think, intergenerational is a really great term to, get, um, to describe, you know, part, uh, that elements of this intervention um, that can be very powerful as well. Um, yeah, um, so we are kind of running out of time. This has been really fantastic. I think I see uh, a social media something quick to add, and then I think we can start heading towards uh, wrapping up. This has been a really fantastic uh, conversation and really kind of blown away my expectations of what this was going to be. Uh, I had some stuff, but everyone on the panel has been fantastic and contributing a huge amount. We overcame tech issues, but we can head towards starting to um, wrap up uh, as well. But yeah, since we'll use, were you going to add something uh, as well on the topic of the, the we were just Yeah, um, in, in terms of the intergenerational, like I have sole custody of my daughter and live with my parents, and uh, I have been in groups where um, I have spoken with people that are the same scenario my parents are in um, and have been able to understand my parents more through them and their perspective and they've been able to understand their adult children more through me and my perspective and it, it it's something I never expected to happen here and in a world that's been so great to me just in general but that was that was an added bonus as well because uh, because I've been through so much and I'm I have a hard time with my dad specifically and um, I've learned so much on on you know specific reasons that that might be uh, behind certain things he does does and and other people have expressed that they've learned from me on on with their adult children so I just wanted to add that thank you yeah, that's fascinating. Thanks for sharing that. that. Yeah, that that you're able to, Thanks. you know, some. Yeah, I think that's really fantastic. Um, diversity of age years. Um, well, fantastic. Nora, well, can I say something real quick? Sure, sure. My hand that might won't raise. Um, 
you know, I have social anxiety and uh, when I first come in, I couldn't even barely walk out my door to get in my car. And I can, was convinced that I could go to this store and go through it. And I, I got to the store and I was like, oh my goodness, I got in. But there was no way to get out. I didn't think I could get out. And I phone out and got on in a row through my phone, talked with the guide and sat on in the, in the, inside the store in an aisle and went through a tool and got me up out of the store, back out in my car and on my way home. Nowhere else can you do that but here. You know, I could have called a therapist or a counselor or whatever, but I don't think I'd have been able to get where I had gotten with just taking out the phone and going into inner world. Yeah, they probably would have put you on hold or something. Yeah. Love you, wow. Ella. Thank you for sharing. And that's inter that's actually, we've heard that story several times that folks are using inner world on their phone. I think that's part of you know, uh, CBT and evidence-based tools, um, you know, there's one modality, which is training therapists to make sure they're using the best evidence-based tools. And the other, another option is putting those evidence-based tools in the hands of people so that they can access them and use them when they need and democratize access so that they have access, you know, when you're in a grocery store and need it the most. And that's, I mean, therapists work with patients, uh, their patients to try to get them to be using tools out in the real world for weeks times months uh to try to get them to to that point using it so it's really really cool to hear um that you were able to use a tool in real time uh you know and hopefully it was it sounds like it was also helpful mm -hmm. in that moment so thank you for sharing that um uh yeah can you name me did you have something to add as well oh, yeah i know it's a most over i just real quickly if you have ideas or like you know your townhouse home house meetings or do you check your messaging at all or is there a place we could give our thoughts or ideas or even if if the panel has any information i'm very interested in a lot of um steve holland and all of you um your wisdom and knowledge uh would be beneficial i, I love love um getting uh, growing in this in this field especially cbt about on learning learn behaviors and such so that's just my question. Can we, is there a way that we can get some information and also give some ideas uh, for inner world? Yeah, um, the best place to do that actually now, we've launched our own chat feature. So if you download inner world on a iPhone or a Mac or a PC, um, you'll see that we have a chat section and we have a feedback channel. Um, so that's a really great place to start a conversation. And that's probably where I'll post some of the resources if folks share them with me from the panel. Um, I can post that so that people can access it. Um, and uh, yeah, so just in closing, I'm wondering if each person on the panel can kind of um, summarize. Uh, I know that we, we were going to have each person kind of summarize their research and what they're doing. I think we've done a little bit of that through these uh, great back and forth interactions and conversation. Um, but maybe just kind of a one or two key takeaways that you have from uh, the panel so far and just thinking about the impact of virtual environments on psychology. Um, whether it be specifically trauma or, um, you know, changing folks' perspective or, you know, social connection. I'm just kind of curious um, if folks on the panel can kind of, uh, any kind of takeaways from this experience that you might have. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anyone wants to go first, but feel free and, uh, we, yeah, we can just go around. I'll start if nobody else is ready. Uh, this is Steve. Just say that... Uh, if we've learned anything over the last uh, 40, 50 years, it's that people helping people accounts for the biggest chunk of the variance in outcome. It just, it makes a huge difference. And uh, some things work better than others, uh, but most of the things that work best are the kind of things we can do for each other. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve. Um, I saw Ioni, did you, were you about to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, thank you everyone for sharing. It really is just really intrinsically rewarding to hear from everyone's personal experiences and to keep on doing the work that we do because um, we we are doing this because we want to help others and improve the treatments that are here and um, just like the interventions that are available. And so um, this is very helpful not only to 
keep uh, like myself motivated, honestly, like it's just wonderful to hear that it's working, um, but to keep doing better too. So um, great ideas for, for future research studies and improvements on, on current interventions. Fantastic. Thank you, Ayani. Um, um, I'll share just a second. Oh, oh, did I interrupt someone? No, go ahead. Oh, oh. no, I was just going to say that um, having been a fan of technology for a few years, um, I really think we would be remiss if we didn't do the thoughtful research to study how humans interact with technology and by proxy with each other. Uh, we just have we have tremendous mental health needs in the real world. What the World Health Organization estimates there's about a billion people walking the planet with a mental health condition of which fully two thirds will never see the inside of a therapist office. So maybe, um, you know, applications like this and other techno apps that help bring people together or create experiences, craft experiences for people that are therapeutic. Uh, maybe that's the part of the solution to reducing the underserved or non-served populations. It could really benefit from everything we learned in the previous 100 and 150 years in uh, the study of psychology as a science. So I say, uh, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but uh, I know <laughs> we, uh, we need to continue uh, not being afraid to test things uh, that leverage this and provide new opportunities. Thank you, Skip. That's really, I completely agree. Um, yeah, Kim. Um, well, first of all, just thank thank you all for your stories. I know that they will stick with me for the for the rest of today, um, you know, and for the days to come. So thank you, thank you for all that. That's the best part of all of this, I think, for me. Um, and it was also very confirming about the power of, of of social VR. And you know, sometimes we get a lot of pushback. You know, we submit grants all the time to try to get into schools to help kids, and we get so much pushback saying because people just don't understand what social VR is, especially at like the NIH and other you know kind of uh, those that are handing out the money. So um, this is just a reminder to me to keep pushing forward because I, kn I know we're doing the right thing by wanting to help kids and, and reaching kids. And I think this is a powerful way. So so thank you for kind of a reconfirming, <laughs> especially because we just got rejected for something today, which you do all the time in academics. But this is just a reminder that I'm going to keep pushing forward. So thank you. It's not a rejection. You, it's not yet an acceptance. <laughs> I like that. So true. <laughs> yes. That's what yeah. he told us when we didn't get the first uh, a grant. We just got that grant that we announced. Uh, and yeah, it was funny. Um, that's what he told us the first time. So Ione and I were very uh, excited to have that prove out to be true. Um, yeah, so, and thank you, Kim, for sharing that. I think, um, you know, my major take from this, I have a couple, like one is, you know, the community is everything. Um, you know, you are, providing uh, a profound life-changing experience for one another. Um, and, you know, our guides are helping facilitate those experiences. But ultimately, it's that peer support uh, combined with the tools that I think is really uh, having a great, profound impact on folks. Um, my second takeaway is that I think we need to do this more often uh, of having uh, academics and clinical psychologists and uh, psychologists come in uh, to speak to the community. I think it's a very unique combination of folks with lived experience interacting with researchers and professionals. Um, and I really do think that this can yield new research questions as well. I think people are less inhibited in this setting um, and you really don't get this kind of interaction at an academic conference in quite the same way. Um, so I'm really grateful for this opportunity and everyone on the panel for joining. And then the third thing, my last takeaway that was really surprising to me was the um, uh, this theme that the Cycle, I had to say this carefully, but there seems to be a theme of like the professional psychologists, the goal of new interventions that could in the future be uh, adopted as the, the best way to do things. And so, Skip, especially when you mentioned that there was a lot of uh, that there were a lot of naysayers, for example, when you proposed doing virtual exposure therapy, when now that's such a standard of intervention, that was shocking to me and I had never thought about. I thought there might have been pushback at that time of introducing 
an intervention and different hypotheses about what works and, and what the effects might be. Um, and just as we've heard folks, for example, who have uh, who've reported that, you know, were contemplating uh, suicide and harming themselves and came into inner world and found, um, you know, support and that social support. That's another example where, um, you know, folks who are at one end, uh, you know, who are in a certain clinical situation who, um, you know, is different from crisis intervention, which we don't provide in inner world. But, uh, you know, some folks have said, oh, well, those those individuals cannot come into inner world because they're too high risk or something like that. But look at these stories of profound change that are happening to folks. Um, so I think there's this theme of discovering psychological interventions, figuring out what works, trying to make sure you do it in a safe way. Um, but really, we can, I think, collaboratively, uh, come up with incredible interventions uh, by having folks participate and, um, you know, doing the research as well to validate what works and what doesn't, even if it doesn't end up being accepted necessarily by the uh, overall psychological community or, you know, by psychologists. I think that um, modalities, if, the, if there's the right evidence base behind them, um, you know, the evidence can speak for itself. So, um, yeah. So, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for coming to this. I think that wraps up our uh first conference institute um and thank you to ISTSS that was fantastic. as well thank you so much taking a chance yeah, thank you thank yeah. you really thank you thank, thank you, you all for being here thank you and the panel yeah, i'm just you. going to put us in one world uh we're just going to debrief so if you just hold on for a second uh and thank you all so much to the community please feel free to hang out we're just going to go to the world uh to wrap up uh and there'll be some next steps coming out of this so thank you all so much and we hope to do that do this again soon thanks thanks noah. Thanks, everyone. Everyone. Thanks, noah and everyone else thanks, thank you everyone again. bye susan duck see you later bye thanks everybody bye guys